Welcome, this is a complete video to make a pair of bespoke trousers. It follows directly on from my pattern drafting video where you can use your own measurements to draft a trouser pattern to use. You can use another trouser pattern that you have, but you ought to be clear on where the seam allowances are on both mine and your patterns. You'll find my video series on trouser making in the description. It's all the same video except with much more specific timestamps. If you find my videos useful, if you find this video useful, please do leave a like button. It'll probably leave a like button, leave a like. It'll probably make it easier for other people like you and I to find it. But if you're new here, then I suggest you start with, I'll send you to my start here playlist. So I might suggest you look into getting up to speed with my intro to and then making samples before trying bespoke garments. Enjoy. You need to start by making sure that your fabric is okay and that you have enough. I rolled up my fabric, selvage towards me and laid my front and back pattern onto it. Check the right side, the correct side of the cloth, which is neatly preserved on the inside. Make sure that no threads are pulled anywhere, stains I guess also. And the last thing is to make sure the selvage is lined up. It's important to iron the fabric. Thoroughly steam it in order to pre-shrink the cloth so that your trouser won't shrink at all once we start working, or won't shrink undesirably. Lay the patterns you made onto the fabric, and you should be aware of whether the cloth or the pattern, if your fabric has one, goes one way so whether the cloth has an upside down, and by extension, should you not have enough space to line up the two patterns as is, you could flip one of them horizontally and you'll get the same two patterns, but that wouldn't work if you flip them vertically. Run your hand up and down the fabric because it might have a pile, which manifests in it being smooth one way and rougher the other. You need to make sure that you have at least an extra 5 centimeters below the hem of the patterns, 3 above and have 2.5 centimeters between them. The most economical way of cutting trousers is to flip one side upside down. Of course we can't do that if it has a pile or a pattern. The next best way might be to flip one of the patterns over. As a rule, I like to keep the front pattern always the same way up as we drafted it because it keeps fitting up consistent for me. Another important aspect of laying down the patterns is to make sure they are in line with the grain. Maybe the best way of doing this is measuring from the center line of the trouser to the fold or the selvage, whichever happens to be easier for each piece. You're best measuring from one point and then using that as a pivot point to measure the other one. Upon getting them into position, you ought to use some kind of weight to keep everything in place. One time I used bars of soap, another time I used whiskey glasses. At this point, begin to trace around both patterns. Progress as you wish, but be sure to take down all of the balance marks, like the seat, knee, and construction line between these two. Very importantly, the dart and the front crease line. We don't need the center back line. Using a piece of sharper chalk is best. Don't apply too much pressure. Applying too much pressure will create thicker, less precise lines. It could also move the fabric, changing where the chalk is in the first place. Plus, it'll wear out the chalk more quickly. Try to use the chalk vertically, perpendicular to the cloth. It helps in using the chalk sharply. As you finish copying off the pattern, the paper becomes redundant and you can and should remove it. Inlays are extra cloth we add onto the seams of bespoke trousers. They are largely unique to bespoke because they mean we can alter trousers to a larger degree than we could without. However, some inlays include the seam allowances, so until you know which is which, based on how I use the pattern I make, you should put them on as I do. Then, when you know, you can remove them as you please. The first inlays that you should draw on are the additional five centimeters below the hem and the additional two three centimeters atop the waistband. 
These are on both patterns and are all the inlays you need to put on the front trouser. Below the hem, flare out the trouser, which makes it easier to put up. We can use our pattern to properly mirror the runs from the hem. We would add more here if we wanted to do a fitting and we would cut it down afterwards. On the back pattern, there is an additional 2.5cm of inlay on the outside leg and the inside leg. And it's neat, looking back I almost missed that I had to change the fabric for a minute due to a technical failure. On the seat seam, at the top of the back pattern, extend from the waistline 3cm and that will taper in as it goes down towards the curve. To determine the fly bearer fork notch, the crotch notch, make a right angle at the four part curve from the fly line and the crotch. Mark about 45 degrees onto the curve, about halfway between that and where the line begins to be straight again is where you put your notch. For women, the bottom of the straight is better, for genitalic reasons of course. Lower than that for men, in my experience, the zip can be more difficult to operate. It's at this point that you can draw on your trouser pocket, unless you want a fitting then that can come later. Should you want a slanted pocket, you need to decide on a slant. I suggest marking the seam allowances under the inlay and around the appropriate part of the side seam. I'm starting the slant 5cm from my side seam, which will be 6cm from the edge of the fabric. Then I decide the length of my pocket, usually 18cm, with 3cm of knot pocket above it. From the point we mark below the inlay, find where 21 centimeters meets the side seam, not the edge, the side seam. That will be our bottom notch while the 3 centimeter point is our top notch. You can reference my slanted trouser pocket sample video for a more in-depth guide. You may want to replace the weights at this point as you cut the two pieces out. As fabric is cut loose from the patterns, be sure to mark the grain. You're going to use those bits to cut out the other little bits you need from the same fabric. As we're cutting, keep your hand next to where you're cutting to keep the two layers the same size. If you have an island worktop, that's way better because you can move around the table as you cut it. Otherwise, we're stuck contorting ourselves to cut them out. We want to move the cloth around as little as possible for this. As I cut out the front trouser, I also snip into the fork notch so that I don't lose it. The biggest part you need is your waistband. And you don't actually need a pattern for the waistband since, it, since it's a rectangle of 6cm by half the waist measurement plus 16cm. It doesn't need to be exactly 6cm wide, it can be wider so long, it, so long as it has at least one straight edge. It could be a long piece of scrap from the selvage or the folded edge. Always be sure to mark the wrong side, and like I've said previously, the waistband is cut along the same grain as the trouser. This can be a bit complicated because the fly guard needs to be right side up when it's attached to the inside of the right trouser. I laid my left front trouser right side up, or right side trouser right side down, same thing, onto some fabric, still following the same grain. Like I alluded to earlier, I always have my pattern the side up that I drew it, so that the chalked on side is what's facing upwards for this as well. Start by copying off the notch, curve, inlay and waistline, at which point remove the trouser and draw a perpendicular line away from the curve a few centimetres below the notch. Mark points 4cm and 5cm on that line from the curve. You can see the graphic for a clearer picture. From the top, also chalk a line 5cm from your first line. Hand rail the first curve to about the halfway point before splitting it into two lines. One going to the 4cm point, one to the 5cm point. At this point, extend the waist and inlay lines. Now decide on the shape and dimensions of your fly guard. 
bearing in mind that this dimension will have a centimeter shaved off when it's bagged out. What is good is about 5 centimeters further from the fly at the top and about 10 centimeters below the bottom of the inlay, which curves into the fly. That's not exactly what I did, but it's what's best and what I suggest with my graphic. Cut into the notch a very small amount as you cut out the pattern. On the piece of fabric that you drew on, cut away the extruded block at the top and also the curve at the bottom. That is your fly. Mark the wrong side of the fly guard. If you get it wrong way round, you'll be somewhat displeased. For the back pockets, should you want them, mark the appropriate pieces that you need. For each double welted back pocket, you'd need two jets of 19 by at least five centimeters and the bearer 19 by at least 10 centimeters keeping in mind that the jets are cut long side with the grain, like the waistband, and the bearer is cut perpendicular to the grain. You can see that I unfold the uh, fold of the cloth to cut the bearer here. Here I cut a belt loop to put it on the center back of my trouser and you can see that that is cut with the grain as well. Blind and facings for your front pockets also need to be cut. Lay your trouser over some fabric and if it's a pattern fabric and a slanted pocket then definitely be sure to line up the pattern. Trace around the outside, carry on and an extra 10 centimeters down from the bottom notch of your pocket I'd say. Copy both notches off as well. Mark the waistline, pocket slant, and the top notch. This one will be the blind, also referred to as the big facing. And I worry that I will get tired of saying that this is bespoke clothing that you're making, so they can be whatever shape or dimension you want. But for now, I'm marking a point three centimeters from down from the lower notch, and then I'm adding nine centimeters on behind the slanted pocket line. It's quite large so that my pocketing will not show at all if the pocket gapes open. To make the facing, aka the small facing, copy off the waistline and its inlay again, copy off the notches and copy off the slant, and a few centimeters of the side seam below the bottom notch as well. Take away the trouser to measure down one less centimeter than you did for the blind. It's not totally necessary to do one less, but this way they, the seams won't be sitting on top of one another. The same idea is imply, employed adding four centimeters behind the slanted line. The facing can be smaller since it's less likely to gape anyway. We also add one centimeter in front of the slanted line for seam allowance. Having cut them out, you'll do well to mark the notch and waistline on both, and then the slanted pocket line on the blind, being sure to mark the wrong sides. For the side adjusters, I have the pattern I made in the waistband video. Well, not the same one, my normal one, but my point stands. We can trace it off long side with the grain, marking the wrong sides and splitting them into their four pieces. Or I was supposed to mark the wrong sides anyway. To cut the pocket bag you need silicia, you need it doubled like normal and then folded. What I'm doing is measuring about how much space my pocket is going to take up so that I can fold the fabric in an economical manner. 
I am checking the width of the trouser from two and a half centimeters past the center front line and adding three centimeters. That is about how much I want folded over. I know the height of my pocket, so I mark that on two. I think that 40 centimeters is a good height. Lay your trouser onto the silicia and maneuver it until the fold of the silicia comes to where you want it. Usually the top of the pocket is at the same point as the center front line and the bottom is an inch past the crease. The bottom of the silicia being 37 centimeters below the inlay. Trace around the trouser, trace off the notches, pocket line and chalk on the waistline. Remove the trouser and mark down the amount you added to the bottom of the big facing or the blind plus one centimeter from the bottom notch or half a centimeter for a cleaner result. So I'll mark down three and a half centimeters. From there, you can draw the shape that you want the pocket to be. From the same point, draw the inlay three centimeters out from the side seam edge all the way up to the waistband inlay add a centimeter seam allowance to the slant and draw a horizontal line out from the notch. We are going to cut this section off of one side of the pocket. You could cut it out at this point. Make sure that you unfold it so that you're only cutting one side giving you the asymmetrical shape. Cut the silicia for the fly and fly guard. You only need one of each. Lay the fly onto the silicia and copy off the outer curve, the one without the notch. Without. Extend it by, extend it a bit above the top and bottom and take away the fly. Measure into the proverbial fly by three or four centimeters along our curved line to cut the piece out. It's more economical cutting Silicia like this than on the bias. The piece for the guard needs to more than eclipse the fabric, especially above the inlay. We need it to extend above the waistband, so add at least three centimeters or so on the top. Cut the curtain and waistband lining. These can be silicia or lining, though I think it's a bad idea to make the waistband lining from lining. It requires an extra step when attaching it, so hold fast on that for now, methinks. For the width of the curtain, it's double the height you want plus two centimeters. I've chosen 14 centimeters plus two, which is five and three quarter inches. I suggest cutting it on the fold of the fabric because it is mostly used as one long piece and we can take what we want from it and we can keep and reuse it in later trousers. What we need though is half the waist measurement plus 20 centimeters for, for inlay. The waistband linings are the same dimension as the waistband. We can cut it in one long piece or two pieces. I will do two because it's easier to interpret how to do one long from two rather than two from one longer. Again, we can keep and reuse the extra in other pairs of trousers. The crotch guard reinforces the seat seam like we've all had a pair of trousers split open on us. Here's your preventative measure. Cut two squares parallel and or perpendicular, same thing, to the grain, about 15 by 15 centimeters. Fold it in half across the diagonal. With pinking shears, we'll cut a triangle away from one of the edges, or if you can't, just cut a zigzag line. To cut out your back pockets, 19 by 30 centimeters, I am curving the bottom edges and tapering the top. On one of the pieces, I will mark nine centimeters down from the top edge and cut that away. 
This will leave me with less bulk in the pocket and waistband later. For this method, we also need to cut a piece of linen about 19 by 6 centimeters. I'm making half line trousers, so we want to press and steam the lining to make it shrink and discolor as much as possible before putting it in the trouser. On doubled up lining material, lay the front trouser on the lining in the most economical way possible, with the selvage being around 15 centimeters, exactly 5 inches, coming from an exceptional trouser maker I intern slash interned with, below the knee or a bit above it. The selvage, because it is the least bulky way of making sure it doesn't fray, cut it roughly with at least a few centimeters on each side, cutting it perfectly flush at the top so we know where to line it up. If the selvage isn't an option, then the next best thing is to pinking shear along the bottom edge. We need two lengths of band roll canvas that are just the same length as the waistband fabric. Out of linen, on top of the 6x19 piece for the back pocket, we should cut two pieces for our slanted pockets. 3cm by more than the length of the pocket, say 19 to 21 centimeters. That said, we'll also need linen for the fly and fly guard. As I mentioned in the trouser accoutrements video, I also need the zip, a pair of buckles, catch-ons, the hook and bar, a button, plus another button for my hip pocket, some 3x3cm three three squares of fusing, and silk for finishing. I also keep my inside leg and waist measurement. These are important for making. We might also have a heel and toe inside leg measurement for slanted hems. I'm keeping all these little bits in a Ziploc bag. This is everything we need for these trousers. We can bundle it up and tie it up with some of the leftover selvage. And I think it's quite pleasant to look at like this. Having given the first piece a flatten, before we mark stitch the two pieces, obviously they need to be aligned perfectly on top of each other. When mark stitching, we only need to take down the details, and only as much as it'd be helpful. Hence, on the balance points, you might like to just take a stitch at least one centimeter from the seam. This way, they aren't caught when we machine them. Down the center front and most other straight lines could be very wide. From a human psychology standpoint, I always start from the most work and go backwards. I start marking the outside leg on the back trouser and end with the crease on the center front. More logistically, and trust me when I say that what can be most helpful, the waistband is an important seam. On the front, we want to mark about a centimeter from the front edge, and on the inlay on the center back, do a mark stitch halfway through there as well. At the seat seam, we'd want it more dense. Really, anywhere there's a curve, it should be more dense, and less so where it's just straight. I suggest a mark stitch on the side and in seams, right where it begins to flare out, so that we know where we need to begin flaring at the hem when we machine them and put them together. For the darts, we could just cut notches on either side at the top and do a single mark at the bottom. With the top of the stitch at the exact point at the exact bottom of the dart. If we do this every time, we will be able to stop thinking about it. It will be clear where the dart is. And if we mark stitch all the dart all the chalk in the dart, it tells us the exact same information, but it takes longer to mark stitch and then we need to take that take them out again when we sew the dart closed. Like I said, snipping into the top of the waistband to show the path of the dart from the mark stitch. 
As I finish the first piece, I will always split the marks before marking the next one. Cutting the patterns into two is easy, and when you're cutting the threads loose, do be sure that you can see the whole of your scissors, otherwise you may have to start over. Be aware of where other uncut threads are, because you may pull those out without noticing while trying to cut some others. This is more difficult if you have more mark stitches, so that's just another reason to do less. If it does happen though, just pull out that whole bit of stitch thread and redo it. A couple of things that can make this easy for you is to use a thicker basting thread and to have a greater amount of thread between each stitch. By the time you've done it several times it will become quite easy, even though it feels like hours the first few times. Honestly, mark stitches at this stage are quite tough. I literally have pairs of trousers that still have mark stitches in them because I haven't taken them out and they haven't fallen out. I am also mark stitching the pocket opening onto the blind so that I can apply it properly later. Like I said, it's a different method from the sample. We need to curve the folded edge of the crotch guard. Wet it, use a steamy iron and pull it, stretching the folded edge. Try to shrink the sleesha towards the pointed edge by pulling the point and steaming, pulling the point perpendicular away from the iron rocking them back and forth moving towards the point. Try and press out any creases. When the folded edge is stretched you can focus on shrinking the two raw edges, drawing the iron from the center towards the raw edge. This takes quite a bit of practice and, it's, and it is easier if we do the two pieces separately and on a fabric ironing board, not on a varnished wooden worktop. Basically, we know it's properly curved when we check it on the trouser. We don't want it to be very slim or slender at the top or the bottom where it goes off of the trouser. Take the two apart if not already and place them together with the raw or plain sides together. Take your front trouser and place the point onto the triangle, onto that triangle. Be sure though that the top resides two centimeters below the crotch notch or two centimeters above it. I usually do above it. Cut it out following the edge of the fork. Make certain that you have two mirror images rather than two identical pieces. Like I said, if the folded edge runs very close to the raw edge of the trouser rather than curving away, then it isn't curved enough. You could elect against cutting it just yet and attach it first, trimming it to fit later. On the front trousers, we need to add one centimeter to the pocket opening line towards the side seam. We give the pocket line a one centimeter seam allowance and cut along that line. 
It is objectively better to put the lining on and then do this afterwards, but it doesn't particularly matter for a straight finish. If we were doing a fitting, then we would have to leave it for now. We are going to baste the lining and the crotch guard to the front trouser. Since the lining is cut larger than, than the trouser, start with one side, line one edge as flush as possible, and the top flush as we cut it. Start with basting on the top, starting at the flush side, the more flush side, creating fullness in the lining along the top by pulling a small amount of the lining towards the previous stitch. We can't have the lining be tight. Baste quite close to the edge of the trouser fabric, ke keeping your hand underneath. Go back to where we started and baste down the more flush edge. As we baste down, it is very important that we don't give the lining any ease. Uh, we need the lining to still be 5 inches below the knee as we cut it. I've seen other tailors on YouTube putting ease as they go down the leg, so I'll prevent... So when I say don't put ease in vertically, that's a trouser maker with much more than 15 years as a trouser maker behind her saying not to put ease in vertically. I know I said keep an open mind, mind to methods, although some things have been tried and tested that I will confidently share and say is superior. For the second side, we need to give the lining a small hill's worth of extra cloth, still basting close to the edge of the trouser. There is a hairline sweet spot. We can't have too much, but too little is any less than a hair's less than too much. If we do have too little short term, it could shrink and we'd end up with a smaller trouser. Longer term, it could tear. It comes with experience and really much more easily if you have someone with experience to critique you in the moment. If it's the correct amount, we should be able to brush the lining with our hand to distribute the ease to the point that it feels as though it might disappear. as though if we could press the whole surface at once the lining would lay flat. Too much extra and the lining will pleat too much and too easily. The lining I'm using is rather coarse so I can move the cloth to the desired amount and just do that, but usually you'd have to push in the ease with each stitch. Since I have already cut the portion beyond the pocket opening I will put in a separate base that I will leave in because I'm not going to overlock the pocket opening, which to be honest is exhibit B of should and not cut it away yet. We can do a small check that the amount is correct. Like I said, we should be able to brush the lining with our hand to distribute the ease to the point that it feels as though it might disappear. Once we're happy with the amount of lining we've basted in, we will trim off the excess. Right side up, cut the lining flush with the front trouser. Then we can put on the crotch guard. Whether we trimmed it already, we line it up to the fork in the same way, basting along the edge like we did the lining. Baste it, baste it down and trim away the edges before we overlock. We usually overlock the edges of the fronts and backs to prevent them from fraying. I would say that you're unlikely to have an overlocker, hence you would be okay just to use a normal stitch to hold everything together on the front machining just the fronts less than a half centimeter from the edge. If you have pinking shears as well, I might suggest you trim the fabric all around the inlays to inhibit it from fraying. We would overlock with all the pieces right side up for every run of overlocking. We also wouldn't overlock across the bottom of the hem until we put the front and back together before we put up the hem. You know, before we put up the hem. I'm also skipping the portion of the front where the slanted pocket is. This is going to become a bulkier seam, so I am avoiding giving it any unnecessary thickness. If we didn't cut it away yet, we could just overlock the whole side seam and cut it away later. You can find greater detail in the slanted pocket sample video, but be aware that there are a few differences. Lay the facing and blinds downside down with the bags. Make mirror images between the three pairs of bits. Make sure you know which side is which for the blind and facing, 
i.e. the facing lines up flush to the edge of the pocketing with the notches on the slanted seam, while the blind or big facing sits 3cm behind the other edge of the pocket. But we're not applying the big facing to the pocket bag yet. Iron 1cm under for securing the small facing in place. We might prefer to chalk the 1cm beforehand. To fill the facing in place, line up the notches of the facing and the pocket bag, lining it up to the correct edge. Doing both at the same time, making sure you always have mirror images. Just baste along the folded edges in order to fill them. Once they're basted on this time, I am marking 1cm in from the raw, straight edge of the facing at the bottom. I am leaving this small section unfastened down this time. You can see that when I moor my thread that my first stitch is on that 1cm point. You can fell the facing down or machine it down. I'm overlocking one edge of the blind, like we know this is replacing the side seam that we already cut off, so I'm going to overlock the edge beyond the pocket opening line. Just mark it on for clarity since I didn't want to take my tripod to work. We are overlocking the entire perimeter of the back. Take our shorter back piece of back pocket silicia and the 19 by 6 centimeter piece of linen we cut for it. On the linen, fold up one of the long edges, maybe 3mm, and iron it all along that edge. Place the linen onto the silicia with the folded edge facing into the pocketing and the remainder of the raw edges lined up to the edges of the silicia. We will edge stitch the linen to the silicia along the folded edge. No need to back tack at all. Press the seam and keep it with the other piece of back pocket silicia. You can find more in-depth guidance in my zip sample video for this. Cut the linen for the back of the fly and fly guard. Just place them onto some linen and cut around them as closely as possible. Put the linen onto the wrong side of their appropriate pieces, machine them along the gentle curve with the one with the notch with a less than half centimeter seam allowance. Linen side up both times. Trim the linen exactly around the pieces if it's sticking out a little bit now. For the fly, attach the fly silicia we cut to the curved edge inside to inside, with a little extra at the top and the bottom to sew them together with a half centimeter seam allowance. Then we attach the fly guard to its lining inside to inside with a whole centimeter seam allowance.
We press the flyguard inside out, except such that the trouser fabric is superimposed on the lining by a few millimetres. So maybe if we sewed it with a small centimetre seam allowance, that would have been better. Never mind. A convenient way of doing this, linen side up, is to fold the seam allowance over with the stitching on the edge or a bit onto the linen, ironing it as we go. When we turn it out, there will already be a crease exactly where we want it. Cement the crease from the front with another press. On the fly, iron the silicia tape over and then back over the fly. Then you need to sink stitch between the fly and its silicia on the front of the fly. We can prick stitch it to be more precise or machine it. Now to be fair, we didn't necessarily need to leave the machine and iron the tape over. We could have stayed sat down for a second and just fingered the tape into the same position as we do it anyway, tightly over the fly, just rolling it over as we feed it through the machine. Firstly, we overlock around all the back trouser, except for the hem. It is very important that we overlock it before we sew the dart, because the dart will want to open and stretch at the top when it's folded downwards into the trouser later, and it won't be able to do that if the dart is overlocked closed. To prepare your waistband, you might like to overlock one of the straight edges of the cloth. Usually I use the selvage instead, but I will overlock one of the sides parallel to the grain. To be fair, I don't think it needs to be overlocked though, like at all, ever. This is an alternative method for making side adjusters that I think might be slightly superior. Fold them in half long ways, right side on the inside, and sew the ends with a half centimeter seam allowance. We might like to trim the fabric beyond the stitching on the folded edge so that it'll sit nicer when we fold it out. We are ironing the seam open. Flip it out and gently push it into a point, making the point symmetrical and ironing it down like that. With the seam we made on the outside, fold it in half again to machine the long edge with a half centimeter seam allowance. Do the same for both, and with the long tab, we also need to fold the small side with the seam allowance in the middle of the tab. Folding the seam allowance open and machining that little bit back and forth with a half centimeter seam allowance. Press the seam allowances open, flattening the tabs gently into arrows. We could brush them with a little bit of tailor's soap just before we turn them out to hold the tabs flatter later. We can use a knitting needle, or in my case a chopstick, to flip the tabs outside out. But whatever you can do to achieve the same effect.
We can use the chopstick as well to massage rather than push or force the corners out giving us good strong right angles in the long tabs. Final iron, manipulate the tabs into as symmetrical arrows as is efficient and give them a press in place. Once we're happy that all four pieces are quite similar, we can put them in our Ziploc bag with the buckles. Remove the basting, excess threads, stitching, whatever, and press the perimeter. I also want to snip into the crotch notch again so that I can see it through the overlocking. I can't do what I normally do to create the center front crease because domestic irons don't have a strong forceful jet of steam button. I'm just going to adapt. I'm starting with just pushing the excess lining towards the side seams away from the center front. Usually I'm using the strong forceful jet of steam to just press the excess down and it looks very wrinkled that way but it does sit quite flat. I'm folding the trouser in half gently along the crease preserving where I put the lining. The crease usually starts a little above the bottom of the rise, so we can start there. Feel through the fabric and make sure the lining is clean and flat under there. Place the iron onto the fold and begin to create our crease. Ordinarily I'd be, a, I'd be pressing the entire width of the trouser, but the lining is dense at the edge and, I would be, and it would crease significantly, so I won't do that here. As I begin to move on to the next section of the fold to crease, again I'm feeling through and gently forcing and rubbing my hand through the fabric to the lining, making sure it's flat under there. As we get to below the lining, it's easy just to press it flat, there's nothing there to complicate it. Check that your crease is sharp enough to pass the paper test, and also check the lining side. We want a good single crease in the lining as well. If the lining is creased or pleated, then just iron those out. Here you can see where the overlocking is on the blind, so you can see just before we start making the pockets. I'm pressing over the one centimeter on the two edges to get them ready for making. To prepare the waistband, place the fabric wrong side up to place the bannel canvas onto the overlocked side, such that the bias tape on the edge is sitting on top of the heavy waistband canvas. I'm pinning them together so that I don't lose the correct sides when I go to the machine. I'm not bothering to chalk, I'm just going to hold them together so that the selvage is about one centimeter from the edge of the canvas, or not the selvage, in this case the overlocking. When you sew them together, sew about 5mm from the edge of the waistband canvas, don't bother back tacking at all. As we're machining, hold the waistband taut to the effect of not allowing the fabric to be pulled by the feet, which would create unwanted ease. In the same sense, I'm doing it section by section so that I can hold, down the tiny, hold it down on the tiny amount of table that I have with my machine. Keeping the waistband fabric under constant tension.
Iron the seam. Iron the waistband taut over the canvas. To make it very clean, smooth and flat, lay it fabric side down first. Lay your hand onto the fabric and push the canvas into it. Use your iron as a weight to press it flat in the first corner and then do the same all along the waistband. Then we can baste and or overlock the bias tape, trimming away any excess fabric. You can see me using that method in the waistband sample video. We could also use tailor's soap on the canvas and then the bias tape and then iron them using the weight of the iron to hold the waistband in place while we pull the fabric vertically straight down, sticking it to the waistband. For the seam, we could sew about halfway through the bias tape to hold it down. While with this method, while the soap is still holding the fabric to the waistband, we'll give it a stitch down the middle of the bias tape. We want to check about halfway through that the fabric isn't being pulled, and if it is, or regardless, I usually do it anyway, if it is, hold the very ends tight together to make sure it doesn't pull any more. If the soap was done well enough, it should hold the cloth and canvas together thoroughly as we sew it. Check that the waistband is acceptable, that it hasn't pulled, that the cloth isn't dragging, that there aren't two big bubbles, and we'll move on. If you do have some pulling or bubbles, then you can try to press the extra cloth to shrink it down. If that doesn't work, then you'll have to try again. You can see that the entire perimeter of the back trouser, except for the hem, is overlocked. Never overlock the hem until the leg is put together and the hem is trimmed. If it is really fray, then maybe pinking shear the raw edge. To prepare the back trousers, first thing you need to do is extend the darts up into the inlay. I suggest that from this point on, largely only chalking on the wrong sides of the cloth. Chalk the dart onto the piece of fabric that's only been mark stitched so far as well. How I mark stitched, I know where the center bottom of the dart is, and I cut notches into the top so I can put those together and I don't need a center line of the dart. We also know where the top is because we have the waistline mark stitched. Technically these are clems rather than darts. I'm pretty sure a dart is one that opens and closes. A clem is open-ended. We could taper the dart inwards on the inlay. This isn't totally necessary though. We can make a straight stitch top to bottom. Either way, don't back tack at the top of the cloth. It's very important that we always overlock before we sew the dart, we don't want the dart to get caught in it. When you fold the dart over, iron it flat and you can baste it if you want. Don't baste on the dart line just next to it. When you start machining it, pull an excess of thread and do hold it when you start sewing. Start sewing from the top whether you're sewing all straight or tapered. And when we get to the bottom of the dart, keep machining off of the fabric that which will quickly and easily secure the thread. To attach the flies, step one is attaching the fly to the left trouser. Lay them right side to right side. Align their notches or pin or baste it in place. Or not, whatever. I'm just going to hold them together properly at the machine. But before going to the machine immediately, step 1A is attaching the zip to the front of the right trouser. Line up the zip top side down to the notch and or mark we made and baste it in place. When we place it down, we need to place the bottom stop of the zip a small amount above the notch. At least 2mm and maybe 7mm absolute maximum. 
align the fly guard lining up the notches right side to right side with the zip in between. Moving its lining or silesia out of the way, baste it or not, but know where the notches are and that they're aligned when you're machining them. Machine the fly and the left trouser together with a small centimeter seam allowance. So if you can make a consistent 7-8 mil seam, that is better. It will become a 1 centimeter seam allowance when we fold the fly over. Start right on the notch with the linen up, as we usually should be working with the linen on top. We can sew off of the top of the trouser. With the right trouser with the bearer, sew the three together as close to the zip teeth as possible. Snuggle the foot up to the zip teeth and follow them up the zip. It can't be seen, but I can't even fit my fingernail between the foot and the zip teeth or the bottom stop. Sew them together from the notch with the linings facing up. Chalking the notch on clearly would help to back tack onto it accurately. It's also important if we didn't baste it that the edges are lined up, this being an exception to the linen side up rule. We might need to move the zip pad out of the way if you have a small zip. I think 10 inches is a good size. If it's eight, that's too small for me. If you're practicing, then it's okay, but 10 inches is what I keep in my trousers. We can just sew out the top of the trouser again. Check that the bottom of the stitching is secure and that the machining is smooth and even and that you kept your foot tight to the zip. Remove the basting, give the seam a press. On the fly side, cut at the notch to the stitching and trim away half of the fly seam all the way up. Iron the seam allowance towards the fly from above the notch. Fold the seam over such that the seam is on the inside of the trouser, which should be easy given the combination of how we cut it and ironed the seam allowance. Hold the fly so that the seam is about a millimeter from the fold and press it down. We are not going to baste it yet. For the zip, again, get rid of the basting and press the seam flat. Cut through the trouser, bearer and the zip tape to the start of the stitching at the notch. We'll open up the bearer so that the zip is flat, but we're pressing the bearer's seam allowance open and the front trouser under the zip tape. This way we have the overlocked seam and the zip pointing in towards the trouser and the raw edge of the bearer pointing into the bearer where it will be fastened away later. Chalk the pocket opening onto both sides of the back trouser. If just one pocket, it's usually on the right trouser. I suggest you look at the single welted pocket video, if I've remade it yet, as a guide to where to put the pocket. On the inside of the trouser, at the edges of the pocket opening, you should use two 3x3 three three squares of I also need to apply fusing to where my buttonhole will go. 
Therefore, I measure 1.5 centimeters below the pocket hole, marking the hole straight down perpendicular to the pocket opening, measuring another 15 millimeters for the length of the buttonhole, fusing over it so that I can cut it later. Line up the pocket bag with the linen over the inside pocket opening so that the linen is facing the cloth and the top of the pocket is 2.5 cm above the opening. Make sure that the silicia is even on both sides of the opening as well, basting it as we usually do with silicia. Then get the jets up to. Line the first jet evenly onto the pocket opening, measuring that you have the same amount of jet on each side, basting it down. Copy off each side of the pocket opening onto the first jet, line the second jet up to the first jet, basting it down, and chalking on each side of the pocket opening. I want the base holding the jets in place to be very secure so that the fabric and by extension the chalk marks will move as little as possible in the machine. This is just important stuff to know. To sew them down, I want to reiterate again that getting the start and end point parallel is important. Don't stitch more than half a centimeter from the pocket opening. We really want the two to be one centimeter apart. Having used a sharp piece of chalk will make getting them parallel easier. You'll see more clearly exactly where to start and end. If the machine pushes and stretches the jets, you could have basted it more thoroughly, or just half ignore the chalk marks. Just make sure the stitches start and end in line with each other. And make sure the bottom of the silicia is out of the way, which I bring up for no particular reason. Give the stitching a press, remove all the basting so far. Cut the pocket hole and be sure to cut your chevrons, should you wish I bet longer chevrons would make the next steps easier, just a thought. From the back, without folding the jets through, we can press open the seam allowances. If you have cloth soap, we can brush some onto and into the seams between the pieces to help hold them open. That said, I have very little idea what I'm doing with the soap here. I'm brushing it on because that's something I've seen. I'm pulling out and pressing the mitres down first here. The seam allowance is split where the jet fabric meets the trouser fabric. I'm folding up the silicia, the linen, and the trouser. I'm folding out the seam allowances before pressing the jets towards the pocket opening as here as well. With this method, the welts are generally more sunken into the trouser, which can be an effect you might want. We can use a wooden block if we want and use it to press on what we've ironed. It'll absorb the remaining moisture and help the creases to set.
We'll press up the lower jet, or press down the upper jet, doesn't matter which order. We'll fold the jet towards the pocket opening to the stitching, and we'll iron along the seam. Of course, ironing either side of the unmachined portion of the jet as well. Fold the jet we just did through the pocket hole. Make sure it's flat so that we don't have to worry about creasing it again. Now pressing the other jet from the front, pressing along the stitching. When it's pressed, send, this, send the second one through the pocket hole as well. I just want to touch up the ironing on the lower jet here. We'll baste the welts. Fold the jets down over the seam allowance. If it was done precisely, the, machine, the seam allowance should be 5mm. We, we want the two welts to meet in the middle without gaping or overlapping. Then baste them in place along the welt. No, not the trouser, only basting through the welt. Slip stitch the two welts together as well. This way they won't move laterally, making sewing the chevrons easier. Press the welts like that, still making sure they are linear all the way across. While I'm here, I'll iron the lower jet under itself about one centimeter onto the silesia. Fold the trouser and the silesia either above or below the pocket out of the way, exposing only the welt. We need to machine the welt to the seam that was ironed out of the pocket opening. There is only half a centimeter to sew to, but we should get as close to the first stitch as we did as possible without sewing over it again. I'm not back tacking, just sewing across most of the length of each welt in as straight a line as possible. Sew both the top and the bottom welts. Then for the chevrons, fold them to the reverse if not already pulled and pull the end, moving the trouser and silesia out of the way. Hold the ends of the two jets together, making sure they're flat there. You might like to do a preliminary stitch across the jets to keep them together. Pulling the mitre taut, stitch exactly across where it's cut, between the two layers of stitching right where they end. Go back and forth over the hem. When you've got a sh good strong base, machine the welts together that are just flapping around now. Iron the jets to make them more crispy wispy and at the same time the lower welt up such that you can baste it in place if you didn't do that already. We can edge stitch the welt to the pocket opening, it's much faster and it is stronger. Line up the bearer to the other pocket piece, either making them even or offset the bearer relative to the lower jet by a centimeter and sew that in place one way or another. I'm edge stitching. I'm cutting away a small amount of the bearer and welts so that I don't sew them down in the first stitch of the French seam. So I'm cutting away about 6 or 7 millimeters from the raw edge of the silesia.
Having fastened the welt to the pocket bag, I need to prepare the buttonhole that I fused earlier. I know that I want the hole 15mm below the pocket opening and it's 15mm wide, so I just prepare that in the normal way that I show in my buttonhole video. Folding the trouser out of the way, I based my pocket bags together before machining them, but it could be easy just to hold them together since they're the same size. Folding the trouser up and out of the way, applying the bearer facing outwards away from the trouser. We line up the bottoms of the pocket bag and the raw edges. Sew around the perimeter with a half centimeter seam allowance. Back tack at the top of the short sleesha when we start and end. You can see that I'm not sewing through the welts or the bearer. I trimmed away a little of the excess silicia, specifically cutting away more of the cloth around the curve. Flip the pocket bag right way out. Pull all the stitching to the very edge of the pocket and press it flat. The raw edges of the pocket on top will also be folded over here. Towards the top make the seam a bit larger, meeting the top of the other pocket. Press the whole of the seam in place as well. From the very top we will machine around the top of the pocket with a half centimeter seam allowance to French seam the pocket. Something important to note is that when the front and back pockets are put together properly, i.e. the raw edges are exactly lined up and they are identical in width and the stitching is properly pulled to the very edges, there won't be any excess across the top of the pocket bag when we close the top. So if it's done perfectly, we can either seal the top of the pocket back first or do the second French seam first. That said, I usually seal the top of the pocket closed first so that I don't have to worry about it. Here, I did it second, but I did the pocket perfectly so there wasn't any excess between the French seams. From the front, fold away the trouser again, like I just talked about, and stitch across the top of the pocket above the top welt. This closes the top of the pocket, which incidentally also seals any tabs or flaps up there. Iron and, and inspect your seams, and if they're good, we're good to go. Our back trousers are ready, and we can make the front trousers now. This is a different way of attaching the pocket than my other video. It might be easier and specifically better when we have patterned fabric. First order of business is to attach the pocketing and facing to the pocket opening. Take the facing, which will be attached to the sleesha, 
and place it onto the correct side, the outside of the appropriate trouser, lining up the notches. There is only one way, there is only one correct way around for each trouser when placing the facing onto the outside. Take the pieces of 3 cm linen we cut, line it up to the edge of the pocket piece on the silesia on the outside of the two pieces. Base them all together and give yourself chalk marks at the notches. Sew them together only between the notches with another small centimeter seam allowance, so 7 or 8 millimeters. Cut down to the notches and you might find yourself with a nicer end result to angle the cut from between the notches. Plus, again, cutting away half of the seam from the facing pocketing and linen. Iron the seam towards the silesia. Fold the pocket over and be sure that the front is bleeding out to the back. Here I will cut away the 1cm seam of the small facing and the silesia from above the notch. We should cut to the same place that we cut the notch the first time. We can fold the top of the front trouser above the pocket so that it creates a linear line to the top of the trouser. We can crease that now for later. Should your fabric feature a pattern that should already be close, but lay the front trouser atop the blind in order to make it perfect, which is why we mark stitch the pocket line and the notches. The top of the blind and the trouser should line up as well. Pin them together. Flip it over and fold the sleeve back over onto it, its other half and pin the blind onto only the silesia. Remove the original pins so that you can maneuver the blind and its piece of pocket and attach it. Remembering at the bottom that we're leaving a centimeter unstitched on the raw side in the same way that we did for the facing.
At this point we'll French seam the pocket. For the pocket technique that I want to use this time it's important that I don't catch the big facing in the French seam at all. But if you do then you can attach the big facing and front trouser at the bottom in the same way that I did in the sample pocket. Now we need to be able to move the pocket bag away in order to sew the front trouser and blind together. This is why we left the centimetre or so unsewn. Only cutting through the silesia that is in between the front trouser and the blind, cut the silesia to about level if a little below the blind. Extend the cut one centimetre behind the raw edge of the blind. If we did the blind slightly wrong we may have caught the blind in the French seam if this happens, we can just cut one centimeter into the blind. Cutting away this small square of silesia in line with the side seam. We need to stitch the blind and the front trouser together, sewing about halfway over the seam allowance. Go back and forth over with the machine. We can pin all of these together and we can move the silesia away freely. To fix the trouser front to the blind at the top of the pocket opening, make sure you know where it's going. Have the pocket opening flat on the blind and carry on the pocket line upwards. You also need to make the commensium mark on the front trouser. We can re-iron the mark into it, folding it over so that it's lined up with the chalk marking. Move the silesia behind the big facing out of the way. Get them lined up together and pin the seam in place. First pin it parallel to the crease to fold it back to see whether it's in the correct place before pinning it perpendicular to the crease to machine it down. Only those two layers though.
keep the pocket behind it out of the way. We don't necessarily need to back tack on the top, but follow the crease and end once again at the notch. Back definitely back tacking at the bottom. Since we used a small centimetre seam allowance for the first stitch we did, this stitch should sit 2 to 3 centimetres millimetres from it. If you found yourself having sewn it in the wrong place, you might be able to try again before you take out the previous stitches, and if you were behind where you were supposed to be, you won't have to take them out at all. You should be able to create a box like we did in the sample, and that technically will give you a better finish. I think though, I'm not sure if it works with this method of putting on the waistband. I think we could, we could have done these last two sets of stitches with one trip to the machine if we prepared them at the same time. Here I'm just placing the pocketing and facing portion of the bag into the seam allowance that I just sewed. We'll secure the pocket opening. We'll baste along the opening, keeping the front trouser bled to the facing side to hide the seam. I'm kind of cheating here because I sewed more here, but just sew between the small facing and the front through the pocket opening to keep the seam bled. That's better than what I did. I'm just looking at my trousers for my own reasons here. Our fronts and backs are now ready to put together to make the legs. I don't know if I mentioned this, but a tailor has told me, it's more of a saying, but a well-made garment shouldn't need to be pressed. Just meaning that as we make, we should be pressing it before and after we use a piece. It gives the presser or us, whoever, less work when doing the final press. So obviously it was hyperbole because we're still doing a final press. Lay the back and front trouser inside to inside and line the edge of the front up to the mark stitched edge of the back, ignoring the silicia of the pocket. Line up the waistline, construction line, and seat line, and knee line, and hem line. We want to chalk the points onto the inlay so that we can see them and the front legs marks at the same time. They may not line up perfectly, but it's the most important to line up the waistlines. Everything else is secondary. Baste it in place. Baste closely to the one centimeter seam allowance, but not on it, moving the pocket bag out of the way, basting through the blind slash big facing. We don't need to baste it, we can just hold them together as we machine, but it makes the sewing easier when it's basted, so it's good to do for now. We need to remember the flare we gave the bottom below the hem. If you mark stitched the way I suggested, there's the last mark stitch before it flares, but I guess we can see where we cut it as well. 
We can flare it out more, it's not quite clear, but I do move the bottom of the front trouser further out than the mark stitch. Machine the two together. We're likely starting from the top with one and the bottom with the other. Regardless, when you get to the border of the blind and the rest of the front trouser, it's quite bulky. So, be conscious that it'll try to push the needle away from the one centimeter seam allowance that we want. Making sure we have the one centimeter seam allowance, the pocket will end in the side seam, as all trousers should. Don't back tack at the top or the bottom. Remove the basting here and iron the machining flat. And we need to check that yes, the bottom of the pocket ends in the side seam and there aren't any raw edges, edges showing. We should press the seam open. We basically need to iron the flare separately because it doesn't sit flat with the rest of the seam. Similar at the point that the blind meets the front. We might like to put it on a tailor's ham over the curve or a plank of wood due and due to the unwieldy seam, it might take a bit of oomph to press it down flat and make it stay that way. We might also like to cut down the seam allowance so that it sits flat on either side of the pocket bag. And while you're at it, iron a one centimetre seam at the end of the pocket inlay. Especially at the bottom of the pocket with the cumbersome seams, make sure the stitch line is fully pressed open. I might do the bar tacks and prick stitching at the ends of the pockets now, such that they're hidden underneath the pocket bag, but I didn't, saving it for finishing. To attach the waistband, the first thing I want to do is to mark 3 centimeters and 4 centimeters from one edge of each waistband, making sure the marks are mirrored. 3 centimeters is the inlay that I put on the trouser, and the extra 1 centimeter is the seam allowance of the seat seam. Next, chalk the waistline onto the trouser, allowing it to curve with the top of the inlay. Same for the rise inlay as well. If you've forgotten or lost the mark stitches, I put three centimeters at the top of the waistband. On the bearer side with the zip, mark the waistline and inlay, and on the bearer, we should mark it on as a downward incline so that we can prevent or inhibit the waistband from showing over the front. We should cut the stitching down between the bearer and the silesia to about one centimeter below the waistline, if a little more. 
From the 4cm point on the waistband, measure half the waist measurement and mark that onto the waistband as well. I also want to check the length of the waistline on the trouser. From the inlay mark, we should get a measurement of half the waist plus 1cm for the seam allowance and 2cm for ease. The same amount extra that we had when we drafted the pattern and checked the waist measurement the first time. For some reason mine is drastically bigger than it should be, so I moved the centre back seam by 1cm so that I have less cloth to ease in. And I should have moved the marks on the waistband having done this as well. If you remember when we drafted the trouser pattern, we measured the waistline and it was 2.5cm more than the waistband. The extra cloth is going to be shrunk as we put on the waistband which we measured between the points which is the correct waist measurement. On the front trouser with the fly, measure the waistline from the front edge to the inlay for the same basic check. Line up the three centimeter mark on the waistband to the inlay on the inlay mark we chalked on while lining the bias canvas edge of the waistband up to the mark stitches. Start basting it down near the heavy canvas but on the bias tape. As stated, the waistband on the trouser is a little more than we want. We will ease in the extra fabric as we baste on the waistband to two the correct or finished waist measurement that we chalked onto the waistband. Depending on the material, you might need to reduce the size of the trouser as it is, like I did. We would adjust by moving the centre back, increasing the size of the dart, or even putting another dart in. We will not adjust the waist measurement at the side seam because that would change the figuration. To ease in cloth, we need to pull on the waistband, causing a small amount of rumpling in the trouser. This way, we can line the front mark on the trouser up to the second mark on the waistband and the end result will be that the trouser has the correct waist measurement. It can be difficult to fully understand th this concept so give it a bit of thought. As you do it more and more it will become clearer. It definitely took me several pairs of trousers and a couple of jackets before I understood. You might like to use a pin at at our endpoint so that we know how much ease there is to put in along the whole trouser. Importantly, be sure to move the top of the back pocket out of the way. For the front pocket, you'll base through the blind, but none of the silicia. Make sure the seam allowances and darts are basted down as they are supposed to sit and basted securely so that they won't be moved by the machine. We want to put most of the extra fabric into the back and side because that's where most people need the fabric, being more flat down the front. We'll avoid basting through the fly, we want the fly to move freely. Baste it a second time if there's a lot of ease so that it's better distributed. It'll be easier to iron in and less likely to create pleats and kinks. Wet steam and press the fabric to shrink in the trouser cloth making it easier to machine. I'm not sure why I'm afraid of using water here, I should be getting it wet and steaming it away to shrink the cloth in. We can open up the trouser and the waistband and it'll often be clear whether there are going to be any pleats.
fastened the cloth at the zip so that the 7mm mark and the waist measurement mark on the waistband are lined up. It's important that the zip is open so that we only catch the one side in the base in the waistband seam. Like we chalked on the bearer, we'll line up the top of the waistband to the bearer on a slight downward slope to avoid it perking upwards later. To reiterate on the fly guard, you need to unpick the sleesha to below the waistband. You need half the zip out of the way and you definitely need at least a centimeter of waistband left past the guard which is why we added all 16 centimeters to the inlay to the waistband. That said, if it does come up short, so long as the other end goes past the seam allowance on the back, it will be okay to reduce the amount of inlay we have. To machine, we're sewing along the point that the bias tape meets the canvas, which is the same as a 1cm seam allowance. Don't catch the canvas at all, it won't be able to fold properly if you do. When machining them, you still don't want to catch any of the silicia, hence it has to be done in two parts. With the bearer side, we might want to start with the centre back, while the fly side we might want to start from the centre front. We want to machine along the back onto the blind and stopping where the blind meets the front, the main front trouser. Back tack and flip the pocket towards the back starting exactly next to where you finished, making sure the seam allowance there is open, back tacking again and continuing to the zip and or the centre front. When sewing the right trouser, should your zip teeth go up above the waistline, slow down and maybe use your wheel to move the needle when going over the teeth. Otherwise, you may slam your needle into a solid metal nugget, which doesn't tend to go well. Proceed all the way across the bearer, folding out the seam allowance to sew slightly into it, and don't back tack at all. On the left trouser, sewing to the centre back, keeping the fly out of the way. Still no need to back tack, but if you can back tack exactly onto where the fold of the cloth is without catching the seam at all, that's ideal. Check the trousers, make sure nothing has nipped anywhere, accidentally put in any tiny pleats. Something that I think the Italians do because it traps significantly more ease, giving them greater comfort on the whole. But come on man, let's try to keep it clean. If you did get a small pleat, take out the small amount of stitching either side and try to shrink the fabric with steam and our iron before replacing the stitching. If you're happy with your waistband, press the seam and take out the basting.
we need to split the side seams down to the waistline stitch because the front trousers inlay is going to be ironed up with the front pocket and the back inlay will be ironed down. And definitely split the stitch down to the waistline, not the fabric. Press the seam on the back trouser open and iron the front trousers inlay upwards. You can see all the extra fabric flaring out from the waistband like ruffling, but more subtle, and the seam being clean. Or it would be clean if I could iron it properly. If you wanted a fob pocket for your oyster card or some such as shown in the waistband video then yes we would need to cut down the appropriate width of inlay in order to sew it on. To put on the side adjusters, establish where you want them. Usually the center of the buckle is in line with the side seam of the trouser. Then decide how high you want it. We can trim away any loose threads if needs be. Base them in place. It don't need to be pretty with the long adjuster paint pointing backwards and about halfway through the buckle as standard. Basically do both tabs in the same way but making sure that the tab holds the buckle in place and Basically do both tabs in the same way, but making sure that the tab that holds the buckle in place, the thin part, is secured under the arrow part. Once set, I'm chalking a line to follow with a prick stitch across the top so that I know on both sides where I want to stop felling. Unlatch the adjuster from the long adjuster so that you can get at it. Set the adjusters in places you like, either fell or prick stip stitch them in place, or both. I think felling is more common though. Make sure you make it safe and strong at the points that both sides stop being attached to the waistband, as those, I'm pretty sure, will be under the most stress. As an alternative to prick stitching normally across the tabs, we can stitch from the back, the waistband side, more of a running stitch. We stitch such that we catch the bottom of the non-showing half of the tabs. This way we don't have a line of pricks along the tab. Really this doesn't take me that long anymore, and enough practice and technique it really won't take more than 20 minutes for the four of them. We can just remove the basting when we're done. Align the front leg up to the back leg's inlay. You need to line the front part again up to the mark stitches and line up the balance points. Again, they might not align properly, but it's important that we line up the seams at the seat and the front trouser up to the mark stitches. Base them in place and machine it. You know the drill. Basically the same as the other time except simpler. Still flaring out at the bottom. Don't bother back tacking at the bottom, but do back tack at the top of the leg.
Iron it flat of course, removing the basting and iron the seam open. Ideally with a sleeve board, but a plank of wood works fine too. Flip the trouser outside out and lay it with the front trouser's center line as the fold because it's about time to iron it flat. We should already have a front crease so make sure that it's flat and the trouser is flat to create the back crease. Start on the front and making sure the fabric is flat underneath and all the way between the front and the back that we're working on. This works best if you can place a heavy but soft weight onto the front crease to hold it flat. I would put the base of my sleeve board onto it and then something heavy on top of that. I don't have a sleeve board yet but I'll link the ironing video of this pair where I basically iron the crease again with my sleeve board. In my case I hold the plank of wood onto a small section and use my iron to draw the fabric flatly towards the back of the leg. I would prefer to smooth the cloth just ahead of the iron with my hand, but you know, my other hand is busy. Get it nice and flat up to around the bottom of the rise. If flat across the rise under the seat isn't doable, then just try to keep both legs even. Once the trouser is flat, which is much more easily said than done I think, the trouser sh could be shaped, but for now I'm leaving it out. Though if you want, stretch the fabric of the thigh and the calf and shrink it at the hammies and the shin. Sometime or another I'll detail this better in another video. As it stands, my trouser legs are ready to be put together. Firstly, check that the waistbands are the correct length. I measure from the 7mm mark we made by the bearer half the waist towards the center back. I'm doing the same from the center front on the fly side to the center back again. If these measurements are a little off from the center back, we can just move where that is. Mine is a little off, possibly because I'm measuring over the side tabs. On the fly side, the right trouser, on the inside, chalk on the line that we'll machine so that it's clear. One centimeter from the mark stitches and then one centimeter from the fabric. Follow the seam up into the waistband. Again, I had to move my center back so it's not perfectly following the mark stitches. So I just rejoin them in a natural straight line. Push down the inlay on the inseam such that its top edge follows the rest of the trouser. That way it has ease and won't become tight. Flip the fly side inside out, it's easiest to do it this specific way round, and place the guard side inside of it. Line up the center back, the notch at the bottom of the zip and everything else in between. Be sure the mark stitched lines are lined up, not just the raw edges of the inlay, the inside leg seam and any other balance points. 
the inside leg seams don't necessarily need to line up because some trousers have dress. This is for guys and their little guys. One trouser leg is slightly bigger so that the cock and balls can hang or sit more comfortably. On the outside, we want the fly side to slightly overlap the guard side. That should happen by default if we line up the fabric at the notch exactly and sew it with a one centimeter seam allowance. However, with the fly side on top as we sew it, we can confirm that the notch we cut into the guard is slightly inside of the cut in the fly. Securely baste the two in place. When you get to the inside trouser leg inlay, again, be sure that they won't pull, so push them down a little bit. Be sure as well that the waistband seams and stuff are open. Also through the waistband. I would venture that the waistband is the most important to par part to get even and lined up properly, or second most important part to get right after the notch. To machine, start at the notch. We are only sewing through the trouser fabric, not the zip tape or the guard or the fly. You may favor to use the wheel to stick the needle into the notch with the one centimeter ish seam allowance. Start at the notch where it is cut to at the seam holding the fly. Back tack onto it securely. As you get to the back trouser, you are following the one centimeter from the mark stitch, not the inlay. This is made easy considering we chalked the line to follow. Get all the way up to the top of the waistband, though there are half back trousers where it's only a few stitches into the waistband for greater comfort. When you've gotten around where you want to be, keep the needle in there and turn the entire trouser around. Sew the entire length that you had just sewn. That way, the most vulnerable part of the trouser is less likely to split. Look at what you've done, make sure it's okay and good. The stitch line is smooth and follows the lines that we want.
take the basting out. Iron the seam flat and stretch the inlay a bit. Wet and pull. Don't stretch the stitching though. Do the same at the fork, but you can stretch the stitching a bit. Iron the seam open, which again is easiest on a sleeve board or a ham. If it's difficult to press open, then it might be because the inlay wasn't stretched sufficiently. It might be too tight and might be trying to pull itself back together. With the inside of the fly facing upwards, we can position the fly so that the front trouser is bleeding onto the inside of the cloth so that it can't be seen from the outside. We can baste it in place between the notch and the waistband. Do the zip up and proceed to position the right trouser in place. It should be overlapping by a few millimeters at the bottom and then it's overlapping by the seven millimeters we decided earlier when attaching the waistband. Make sure as well that the waistbands line up. Baste it up so that the whole trouser is closed up there. Baste through as much as you need to, basting up into the waistband should hold it together more securely for positioning the zip. Then baste the zip tape to the fly piece. Make sure you're only basting the two together because there's more sewing that needs to be done between them and make sure that you don't push or pull the zip. Let the zip sit exactly where it wants to on the fly. Something else we could do is to let the front sit flat and gently move the bearer out of the way. We can then chalk onto the fly where the zip tape is. We can then make sure the tape is lined up to that as we fasten it. Fell and prick stitch them. Fell from the bottom all the way up the edge of the zip tape, then prick stitch about halfway through the tape. Both of these only to the fly. It is possible to machine it though, two stitches in the same places as the hand stitches. Take the basting out. To prepare the J-stitch, we need to baste the fly to the trouser. Easiest over a ham or sleeve board since the back of the trouser wants to be in the way behind it. Make sure the fly and trouser are flat together. We don't want either to be pulling or rumbling the other. And we don't want the trouser to be eased almost at all between the stitch and the center front. I'm not pulling the trouser fabric over the fly, I'm just making sure there is little to no excess cloth, smoothing the cloth over the fly. I'm tapering towards the seam as I get towards the notch. To baste the fly down, I'm using a half running, half break stitch with basting thread. Once I fasten the thread at the top, I first make a normal basting stitch. Where I come out of the cloth, I move a few millimeters towards my start point and do a stitch in the direction of stitching. Then I do another running stitch, then another prick stitch, and so on. It looks like a sequence of dots and dashes. The prick of the stitch keeps the basting more secure than it would be if it were just a running stitch. It's difficult to see the dots and dashes from this distance, but take a closer look later. I fasten the baste between the seam, making sure I don't sew through the bearer too much, and especially not its alicia. 
we chalk on the J-stitch to follow a line. The generic measurement is three and a half centimeters at the top and the same all the way down until it curves into the bottom of the seam where the notch is. Interestingly, the math says that our prick stitch should be just hidden the same way as the sink stitch between the fly, between the silesia on the fly. It doesn't seem to work out that way most of the time though. I'm measuring how far the silesia on the fly is from the edge and measuring the same amount onto the front of the trouser. Try to make it as fine a line as possible so that you can follow it with pricks most easily, curving it, curving in, finishing on the notch where the seat seam starts. Close the zip and lay the bearer and its silesia flat inside of the trouser. Chalk the edge of the seam allowance onto the silesia, just feeling through all the way down to the bottom of the bearer and fly. Flare it out a little at the bottom, we might want some excess later. On the centre back, force the waistband inlay down a very small amount and sew it in place, based in place. Not much more than 5mm down I'd say though, but enough to be hidden by the waistband lining later. Tack it to the seam allowance at the bottom, then the top and fell along the top. Tack it to the seam allowance at the bottom, and then the top, and then fell across the top, being sure that the stitches don't show on the outside of the trouser. We don't want any of these stitches to show on the outside of the trouser. Fell across to the top of the other waistband edge and tack that as well at the top and the bottom. Fell across the top simply to hold Fell across the top simply to hold and stop it from being able to open up. It's already secure, we just don't want any there to be a hole that can be fingered. As you get to the centre back, you can just skip across through the middle, not exposing the thread to fell down the other side, to tack the top and skip straight down to the bottom. I'm using my finishing silk for this. If you wanted to base the waistband inlay first, we could remove the basting when we're done, we don't need it anymore. Now we'll secure the back pocket or pockets to the waistband. Be sure they are laying flat against each other and you could iron them as well. Trim away the top little bits, make sure it resides below the top of the waistband, easiest over a tailor's ham. Cross stitch the tops of the pockets to the waistband, being sure that you're attaching it to the canvas not going through to the outside. Before you sew, make sure they aren't tight together and that they won't pull or anything. And that there's barely a tiny amount of slack. We don't want to go to the other way where the silesia bunches are. At this point, because I didn't do it in the waistband video, I'll attach a belt loop to the centre back of my trouser. If we wanted belt loops, we'd have already attached the rest of them when we, when we put on the waistband, though we couldn't put one on the centre back until after we got the two legs together. With our last belt loop then, begin lining it up to the centre back with one raw side about half a centimetre below the waistband, lined up to the waistband, and with the seam facing the waistband, so we see the clean side. Start with tacking it 
there either side. I'm moving the belt loop out of the way first to moor the thread on the centre back, and you may like to cut the corners of the currently exposed edge. When it's secure on both sides, start with one side, fold the loop down and fell stitch a centimetre straight down. Again, tack it like we do the belt loops, prick stitch to the other side and tack that one as well. Fell back up to where we started, making sure the exposed seam is hidden under the loop and between our stitching, which is made easier when we cut the little bit away. Secure the thread out of the way inside of the trouser. We'd secure the top of the loop in the same way as we did the rest. We'll, we'll finish the centre fronts. I'll start with the bearer. Trim away some of the excess cloth above the waistband seam from the front trouser and the bearer, leaving all of the silesia. We'll need the silesia to cover it, but we want to layer the cloth behind it so that it sits more flat. Fold back the waistband such that it is flush with the bearer below it. Iron a crease there so that you know where that is. We need to trim away the canvas. You'll need to unpick a bit of the top and possibly the bottom depending on your exact method. We only need about one centimeter of cloth beyond the bearer to fold back, so you could trim it down if you have much more than two or three centimeters. We barely need a centimeter, but enough to comfortably fasten it down. We will fold it back so that it covers the inlays that we trimmed and layered. Secure the waistband cloth in the same way we did the centre back. Force it down from the top slightly so that we can hide the raw edges underneath the waistband lining. Tack them on the top and bottom and fell across the top edge to the waistband so that there's no gaping at all. Very similar on the fly side, unless you want an extended waistband, then choose how much extra you want beyond the centre front on the fly side, which is the norm with side adjusters, so that there's two hooks and bars sharing the increased strain. We need to unpick the waistband seam so that it's in line with the rest of the trouser again and cut away any loose threads. Trim the excess cloth from the fly and inlay from the trouser front, layering them both, cutting off the top of the zip so that it sits about halfway through the waistband. Again, fold and crease the waistband so that it's flush with the center front to trim off the canvas. I suggest leaving more cloth, like three or four centimeters, that we can set the hook onto. Fold the cloth over the top of the zip and the cloth that we layered. For the last time, force it down from the top slightly so that we can hide the raw edges underneath the waistband lining. Fold it up slightly on the bottom as well and get that secure. Tack them on the bottom and the top and fill across to the edge of the waistband so that there's no gaping at all. I also fell across the bottom of the folded back piece to fasten the top of the zip down underneath it as well.
Depending on the exact type of hook and bar you have will dictate the exact method of attachment. But with a normal two-piece hook and bar you need to begin by cutting a strip from your leftover curtain to loop through the hole in the hook, which will hold the end of the waistband in a curve. When attaching it, be sure that the hook is on top of the folded back front fabric. Place it little closer than half a centimeter from the front edge, otherwise it's too visible from the outside. Not too far either though. I'm also marking about halfway down the waistband. To secure it, you will be best using doubled up silk because it needs to be really strong. For the same reason, we need to catch the canvas. Start with one of the front holes and go through that one a few times, sewing around the entire perimeter of the hole so that it is held in place properly from all angles. Moving on to the other going between underneath the fabric so that there isn't two centimeters of thread exposed. While it is important to sew through the banneral canvas, it is equally, if not more important, that we don't have any exposed thread on the outside of the cloth. It becomes unsightly and susceptible to being damaged. Again, circling the hole, making stitches all the way around the perimeter. Then moving to the back, last one, securing it either side thoroughly. With the hook set in place, use the strip that you attached and pull on it slightly only enough to curve the end of the band. Attach it there to the waistband canvas. We don't need to tack it too far, maybe two or three centimeters from the hook. It doesn't need to be pretty, but it does need to be secure and not visible from the outside of the waistband. We can trim off any excess silica beyond where we tacked it. When you attach the bar, you need the exact position of where it needs to go to couple with the hook. Do up the zip, make sure the waistbands line up, chalk the vertical tip of the hook and both sides of it as well. We need to make the holes on our vertical chalk marks. Now we best use an awl, it's used for making holes in cloth without cutting or breaking it, rather just moving the fibers out of the way. In lieu of said tool, we'll have to improvise, easing into it with progressively larger instruments, beginning with a basting needle or the largest needle you have. Then we could use a nail. I use a spiral shank nail. In spite of what I'm clearly doing, I think it's best to make the holes where we drew the intersecting chalk marks, not just inside of them. Make the first hole and stick the bar through it, not the easiest thing to do unless your hole is big enough. If we can, put the bar somewhere to hold it upright and all steady and pull the trouser hole down onto it. We might need to push the cloth or the canvas fibers a little from inside in order to get the widest point through. The second side is a bit more of a challenge and you need to do some acrobatics to get it in there. We need to make the second hole and force the bar further into the first hole before we can get it into the second.
Check when you get it in place that it's in the right place on both the vertical and the horizontal. Make sure the waistbands line up properly, have a good look at it and check that the front trouser still has the 7mm overlap from the seam where the zip is. Use the same thread you used for the hook. Sew the bar through both its holes to the canvas, still importantly not catching through the outside fabric. The three-piece catch-ons with the no-sew bars that you stab through the fabric and then bend the prongs into a secure position, those will basically go in in the same way except it's a little bit easier. In a lot of ways, the order of finishing doesn't wholly matter so long as it applies the principles that we can hide where we start and end stitches while securing them strongly enough. Most finishes, it seems, use a knot to fasten their thread. I prefer to tag my thread in place, this way I don't have a dense piece of thread. However, I expect it is more likely that it can get pulled out over time. Now, it's practically a case of felling together all of the lining or silicia, which is basted to some other lining or silicia. However, you really want to start with the curtain and pockets, so that the stitches can be fastened up underneath the waistband lining out of sight. We can take the basting out as and when it becomes redundant if we want, reduces the workload later. Felling the rear of the side pockets, the silicia should already be basted properly, so we just need a neat fell. Start at the bottom, fastening the thread on the inlay, preferably on the horizontal, jutting out from the bottom of the pocket one centimetre or so, felling across, then up the folded edge. Again, getting to the curtain, still felling to the trouser inlay if convenient, but no stress if only to the curtain fastening the thread under the waistband out of sight. Then the front of the pockets to the curtain only up to the waistband. That said, on trousers made by better trouser makers than I, these aren't fastened together. I almost suggest you skip this one on both sides and take out the basting. Make sure that the curtain under the front of the, of the trouser goes quite far under the pocket. Also, I suggest pinking shearing the raw edge underneath it. Not stitching these together will reduce the pulling between the pockets and the centre fronts. Felling the curtain to the flight is a very simple case of fastening the thread unobtrusively at the bottom and felling the fly up to the curtain, still fastening out of mind under the waistband. We should start filling the waistband near the hook on the bottom. Fasten the thread and make headway towards the first corner of the side nestled in the hook.
start filling up the cilicia and we can get only a few stitches before we hit the hook. Go under the hook and under the fabric if possible. And with the recommended standard hook, with the hole, make a couple of stitches in there. Under the hook again, fell up the remainder of the cilicia around the corner to fell all along the waistband. At this point, we're keeping the cilicia tight into the cove of said hook. At any point finishing the waistband, we can take it out, take out some of the basting in order to move the seam so that we can straighten it, making it more level than maybe it was. At the center back of the waistband where we have the overlap, we don't need to fell that down. There's nothing stopping you, but it's no bother. Leaving it open also gives greater flexibility and ease, so it's under less strain. At the bearer, just finish felling the top of the waistband, fastening the thread underneath the cilicia. Do the bottom side of the waistband, starting from underneath the bearer's cilicia, and a simple fell all the way across where we started. When we get to the pleats, we should fell through as much of the cilicia as possible without straining ourselves, but also tacking the top of the pleat together at the center back. At the, top, at the bottom of the fly bearer, start with fastening the bit you folded up behind the fly uh, and guard earlier with a cross stitch. We don't want the stitching to be visible when we look at the inside of the trouser though. I'm cross stitching across and when I get to the end I tack the thread before moving on without cutting and starting a new thread. Proceed then to prick stitch the cilicia to the seam allowance. We could also, or in lieu of that, fell the guard cilicia to the trouser lining. Either way, we do not want the stitching visible on the outside of the trouser.
When we become level with the bottom of the curtain, I'm stitching across my folded edge, stitching the silesia to the curtain. Fell upwards, sewing the silesia to the curtain, then the waistband lining. At the top of the waistband, fell across the top of the guard lining to the waistband. Finally, down a little beyond where we cut the machine stitching, securing the thread in place. We chalked where we had cut the seam on the bearer, so we chalk goes onto the silesia, but we also know that it starts 2cm from the outer edge and ends 2cm beyond that. Chalk the waistband seam onto the silesia as well. We can do a simple baste around the hole quite far though because we don't want to interfere when we fold the silesia. We'll cut the silesia like a pocket opening cutting a small hole in the centre and cutting towards both sides of the hole, stopping short to cut the mitres. We can make the hole one or one and a half centimetres tall, making sure we have a bit of space before the pressed up seam allowance inside, and only the pressed up seam allowance that we cut is visible through the hole we're making, which is where the chalk markings come in. We need to fold the small amounts of silesia under themselves up to the corners so that we cut so that the raw edges aren't exposed. We need to press them in place since we can't really base them down. I tried using my scissors here to poke the seams under. We should use our button to check that the hole is big enough before felling the perimeter of the silesia. If there are any more raw edges peeking out, then forcing them away as well making sure too that our stitches don't show on the outside of the bearer, that we only fell the silesia to the seam allowances. We are going to cut the waistband seam, so we need to secure either side. Do a part bar tack either side of the silesia, ensuring it's nicely aesthetic from the front of the cloth.
Once secure, we can cut the hole open, snip the waistband stitching between the tacks open, clearing it away as though it were never sewn. And then a final check that it's big enough for your button. Do up the zip and hook and bar to find the position of the button. Use chalk holding the buttonhole down and mark the point of the bearer's hole furthest away from its trouser. We know the vertical location of the button level with the waistband seam. I'll link off Maurice Sidwell's button video again, so I will gloss over actually attaching the button. We should sew it through as much as possible without, without sewing through the front of the trouser, since it bears some of the strain of the zip and the catch on. Also, stopping the waistband on the bearer from poking out above the waistband in front of it. Doing up the button and hook to make sure it's in the right place. You'll also fasten the curtain down from inside of the pleats. Secure it to the inlay at the back, to the back pockets, or just the dart as appropriate. Keep the tags quite subtle. Now we'll prick stitch the pocket opening. You can do these little bits when they first come up, but it's better for me to structure this doing it in a, as a finishing section. Get scot of any thread markings that are in the way, start with a bar tack at the top or the bottom of the pocket. Stitch through everything, giving either side of the bar maximum purges to hold the two together. Coil, coil the thread around the bar gently, pulling the thread away from where you started. Finishing the bar and starting the prick stitch up the pocket opening, maybe half a centimetre from the edge. The prick isn't just for decoration, it's to hold and set the edge. It will stop the facing from peeking out from behind the front of the trouser, in the exact same way that the basting is holding it now. Prick stitching, make sure you catch through the facing, otherwise it's half worthless. Bar tack the other end of the pocket and fasten it, fasten the thread somehow neatly. Clear any remaining thread marks and basting for just neatening it up. For the J-stitch, secure the thread out of the way on the inside. Just prick stitch along the line we chalked, fixing the fly to the front trouser.
When we get to the bottom of this seat seam, where the J stitch will be ending, we will do a bar tack in order to keep the two fronts securely together. Make a few bar stitches across everything and coil it off nicely. Send the needle to the reverse to secure and hide it as discreetly as possible underneath the fly bearer thing. On the fly side, on the center front, we need to prick stitch down to the notch. Start at the waistband and bar tack between the waistband and the fabric. Tack through everything to make the bar and coil around it. Prick stitch right along the edge all the way down to the notch and secure the thread. Again, like the pockets, it's to fix the seam so that it stays bled into the off side and doesn't become visible at any point. So we need to sew through all the layers and fix them together properly. At the bottom, secure and hide the thread anywhere you happen to see fit. We need to prick stitch the fabric down to the zip on the bearer side. Fasten the fabric somewhere discreetly at the top of the waistband. Send the needle to the front right along the edge of the folded fabric. Prick stitch the fabric to the zip tape. It doesn't really matter if we take more or less, but we don't want this stitch to be visible from the back. When we get to the bottom, again, we're just securing the thread discreetly. Similarly to, the center, similarly to the center front, we need to prick stitch the edge of the bearer starting from where the waistband meets the bearer, again doing a bar tag between the two. Do a similar prick stitch along the edge to the bottom of the bearer. We can fasten it behind the bearer and the fly where we cross stitched it earlier. Anywhere that happens to take your fancy really. We need to bar tack the fly and bearer together. Just sew a bar tack near the bottom of the fly and bearer, I'd say about level with the bottom stop of the zip. Since I chose a hole and button or H and B closure for my back pocket, I need to sew the buttonhole and sew on the button. You can reference mine or any buttonhole video, but this serves as, a, as an example of how I might start and end a buttonhole in an actual garment, and I suppose specifically in a back pocket.
To make sure the button goes on correctly, I lay the trouser flat and the pocket closed, and mark through the hole where the keyhole is onto the bearer, giving it its purpose. Again, there's a sewing on buttons video linked in the description so that I can gloss over sewing the button on. We need to detack the hip pocket, no differently to how we've detacked any time before. To sew up the hem, not the end of the thread, and start at the peak of the folded triangle, securing the thread underneath the fold. Fell up that seam without catching through the outside of the fabric. From the top, I'm tucking the thread before doing the hem, or blanket stitch from hand stitches part 1. Again, there's no such thing as too dense, but there is a point of diminishing results, and there's how long it'll take you to do it. About one centimeter between them is good, you could probably get away with more for tweed and denser for finer fabrics because of course we're taking less of the fabric, so we'll just take more lesses, right? When we hem across the inlays and seam allowances, we can just stitch to the seam allowance and inlays and don't need to take as much care to take as little as possible since it doesn't show through. We can keep going around like that until we make it back to the start. We can keep going around like that until we make it back to the start. Make sure to stitch over the slightly overlapped portion where we folded the triangle and secure the thread. Proceeding to hide the tail of the thread. At the fork, you'll fasten the seam allowances and sticky out bit of the inside leg inlay to the inside leg inlay. Sew the seam allowances to the inlay too, and don't catch the outside of the trouser. If the pieces are overlocked, then we can cross stitch over following the half centimeter seam that is overlocked. We'll almost always cover the fork with something, so aesthetic it does not need to be. We could trim down the side seam inlay that's sticking out from the seam allowance, or just cross stitch it with the rest of the inlay. Cross, cross stitch both sides, obviously, without catching the outside trouser fabric, only stitching the seams to the inlay and seam allowance. We can skip over the seam instead of starting and ending two different stitches. It's a kind of principle of saving a few seconds with each project adding up, adding up over time. If you do this for a living, you know, in my situation, though, it almost doesn't matter. On the top of the fork, we need to make a square of lining with a piece of lining about 16 by 30 centimeters folded in half inside out. 
or enough to create about a 14 by 14 centimeter square. Essentially, measure from under the fly to the inside leg seams. Double that, and that's about the dimensions of the square you want. Close almost all the seams so that it can be folded right side out, which will be felled closed. Iron it flat with these seams on the inside. Place the square onto the fork with the first corner hidden up underneath the fly and bearer. Tack it to the seam allowances there. Then the diametrically opposing corner, tack it to the back trouser inlay, but we need to make sure there's enough slack. Maybe hold it in a position on the seam allowance and pull it every which way so that you know whether it would pull. If it doesn't, then tack it to the seam allowances there too. Following that, either side to the inside leg seam allowances following the same principles. We need to remove all of the basting and marks that we want to get rid of before we iron our trousers, and any chalk markings for that matter. We can spray a small amount of water on the chalk and use a toothbrush to get rid of the marks. We could also use a cloth brush or just be ghetto and use a scrap of the same cloth to rub it off. If we used wax chalk then we'll just iron the markings away. There's an unlisted uncut version of ironing in the video description. Lay the trouser legs folded on the creases we already made. Gently fold the first leg up out of the way. Start with the hem, which should be flat, but we are reinforcing and really trying to cement the crease, moving up the center front crease again. I move the slanted pocket bag out of the way of the seam so that I can press the front creases all the way up. Again, I want to press in the back crease, positioning the cloth in the same way that I did the first time using something to hold the front crease flat and drawing both sides of the cloth towards the centre back, making sure they're as flat together as possible, pressing the back crease again. If we've moved it and didn't do it the right, right the first time, then we'll wet the cloth to remove the old crease and put in the new crease to a little above the seat seam. Gently flip the trouser over and press the other side of the trouser in the same way following which we need to change legs, more importantly to gently fold away the ironed leg away. And I spend a few minutes trying to remember which side I just ironed. If we had shaped the legs we can do it again, stretch out the calf and thigh again and shrink in the shin and hamstring again. Iron up the seam, being careful and using a press cloth otherwise the inlay and overlocking is liable to get marked onto the leg. Turn the leg over and press it flat on the other side. At a few points I used some water and sprayed onto the trouser to get rid of some train tracks and give myself some strong creases. Also I tried getting rid of a stain with some cloth soap but the soap wouldn't melt under the iron and I didn't go and get a warm damp cloth. So it's still there at the end, it did come off though, with the stain by the way. 
of course we need to iron around the top of the trouser as well and it'd be advantageous to use a tailor's ham or sleeve board while still ideally making use of your sacrificial cobble. Usually we can get by without the cloth and I am here for the sake of visibility. Get each section steamy but not necessarily wet but not necessarily not wet and use the heat of the iron to dry it off. Be sure that everything is laying flat, that the pockets and curtains are flat and that all the seams are properly open. Just work around the whole trouser just below and on the waistband. From the inside as well we need to iron the waistband pockets and curtain. When putting it on a hanger, we need to preserve the front and back creases, making sure that the point of contact of the trouser to the hanger is flat. Which might sound pretentious to say out loud, but it is what you need to do to preserve the pristine cloth and the paper test worthy creases we have.